Hi, everybody. Welcome to the interview with Helen Martineau, who can't get her camera working at the moment. And so we're trying to get her on. And uh, let me just see. Sorry about this. We've been trying for the last uh, 15, 20 minutes to get this. So I'm just... Here you are. Oh, my God. All right. Click on the link. So it, Helen, let me read her bio while she's sorting that out. Yeah, I'll just find somewhere to sit because I'm bending over. Okay. Helen, stop talking and get on the camera. <laughs> and I'm allowed to boss around because she's my mum. <laughs> so yeah, let me... Happy. Shush, stop talking. <laughs> I, all righty so here we go helen martino no i can't see you yet so yeah enter broadcast studio enter broadcast studio we'll get there helen, helen martino yeah helen martino tech is not her best thing <laughs> but she oh helen shush stop talking just jump on <laughs> Okay, I'm on the phone to her. I'm coaching her to get in. All right, Helen Martineau is a teacher, speaker, author, and lover of the mysteries. Here she comes. Her early career in the arts. Helen, stop talking. All right. Now I'm going to turn her off because we've got all sorts of noise. Phew. All righty. So I'm just going to click on her, add her to the stream, and yay, we did this. Oh, my God. All right, <laughs> Helen, Helen, welcome. So for those of you who may not know, Helen is my mother and she is a marvellous, wonderful mother. And Helen is a teacher, speaker, author and lover of the mysteries. And her early career in the arts led her into humanity's great myths and spiritualities. We can see you making those faces. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to, to turn the light off. <laughs> Sorry. <You're right. laughs> and she spent the last 30 years as a wisdom teacher and writer. Helen has written three books and they are uh, Prodigal Daughters, The Spiritual Significance of the Arts, a biography about my grandmother who is uh, Sheila Florence, who is Lizzie on Prisoner, and um, the marriages of the Magdalene. Now, I, I'm going to start by sharing a little personal story because when we're when I was a little girl in England and Helen was studying, she's a historian and she was studying at the Open University and we were in Lancaster and I had this little nook, like you had that, remember you had that desk, that desk yeah. under the stairs? in that old Georgian farmhouse that we lived in yeah. and I used I cleared out a spot in the bookshelf and I used to go and curl up like pussycat in the bookshelf with and, and just to be near yeah. her while she was yeah. studying and writing because it was like being in church when you when you were studying and writing it was like this this feeling of the embrace of of the the mystery of the mother and the mystery of the exploration of the researcher and it was quite beautiful i think you should turn that light back on because we need some light on your face yes okay yeah so ah another light <laughs> we had better tech, you? sorry yeah not where, it's not where i set <laughs> Okay. And Helen and I have been having conversations about the mysteries of the feminine for yeah, for decades. And Helen has a particular uh, passion for Mary Magdalene, but she's used her her work as a researcher and as a historian to ground this imaginative treatment and this spiritual perspective that she has that is so rich in wisdom to ground it in what is historically possible you know where where are the threads the stories actually where do we find them in history would you say that's right helen yeah yes yes absolutely yeah, yeah. and so can you share with us 
why Mary Magdalene? What is your passion for Mary Magdalene? And and as this, I guess, this feminine Christ initiate, as you call her. Yeah. Yes. Well, I've always been interested in spiritual things, so that sort of, um, I guess, set my life in motion. And um, I grew up in a in a patriarchal society, you would say it, where um, women were supposed to just sit around and do the cooking and look after their husbands. And um, it was, this was, you know, way back in the in the um, 60s when life was very different than it is now. Women just, women did work, but um, they were expected to give it up if they got married and had children. But um, anyway, I um, journeyed through this trying to discover who I was as a woman within this society. And as well, I was very interested in the spiritual aspect of life. So those two came together through, I guess, a feminist approach to existence. And it began very seriously for me, I, I guess, at around about um, 28 age 28 and um, I don't know if you take any notice of dreams but I used to and mm -hmm. dreams can be quite archetypal and they can appear at certain stages in your life and especially at certain ages and in at the age of 28 it's called the second Saturn return if you know anything about astrology and in that Saturn return you come to terms with your life and I had this amazing dream. My, my then husband was a theatre director and um, we had amazing times, all times in around the theatre and with the actors and writers and all that sort of thing. So it was great fun, wasn't it, Dominic? Yep, it was. It was <laughs> but, um, yeah, we had a fantastic life. But meanwhile, mm -hmm. I was trying to discover who I was. I'd been a dancer and had given it up, but I was still teaching dance but I knew there was something more for me. Anyway, I had this dream that I, I was in this boat on the river with a whole lot of the actors and performers and musicians and we were having a wonderful time and then the boat capsized and we all fell into the water and a boat quickly came along and rescued everybody and I, I turned around and said, no, I'm not going to be rescued. I'm going to go that way and I started swimming towards the end of the river, towards the ocean. And I woke up with this realisation that my way had to be different. My way had to be my way and only my way. And that set me off on a long spiritual quest. So that was the beginning. As a child, and I've noticed a lot of people have been talking about oh, the inspiration. Oh, sorry. This is <laughs> and if I get teary in this, this interview, okay. please explain Helen's my mother, so in a lot of ways her story is my story and, you know, I love you very it much. Is, so. it is. Yes, it oh, is. I <laughs> so so I, I'll go back to my childhood because I, I noticed a lot, in a lot of the um, chapters people were talking about their childhood influences and I was a very shy child, very withdrawn and a little bit odd and I was picked on at school. Um, not all, not deeply bullied but bullied a little bit but I did have what two talents one was as as a drawer I could do fantastic drawings of people and animals and the second one was as a writer and my first published book which my mother kept I mean published by her putting it together and sticking it together with sticky tape was at the age of seven <laughs> And I've still got it, and it's it's quite funny. It's all about this little girl who is the star of the circus, and um, she's and she gets picked on by this horrible bully girl. <laughs> so it's obviously a bit of psychology in there. And um, anyway, she wins through and becomes the best tightrope and tightrope walker in the world. So that's the story. But um, people, kids used to ask for my stories in school you know when we're in school and we'd all have to write a story and and teacher said I'll read one out and they'd all say Helen's Helen's because mine were the most exciting and most melodramatic <laughs> so that was my background as, as a bit of a loner a bit of an odd bod but also as someone with two talents 
and neither of them I actually used. I trained in art, but I didn't use that, and I stopped writing completely for many years, and I trained as a dancer. And I think that came because of the music. I wasn't, I wasn't very physical, but once the music went on, that was it. I, I could dance one night away. So where am I? I'm at age 28, setting off. We I just finished a university degree as, as a mature age student studying philosophy and literature and loving it. I could I literally feel my brain turning over. It was so exciting. And and then we did, my husband then decided we're all going to come back to Australia. We actually loved living in England, didn't we, Dominique? We did. Broke my we heart. Did come back to Australia, well, to yeah. come to Australia to start yeah, with. Yeah, come to Australia for you, but for me it, it broke my heart to come back because I loved living in England and mm -hmm. Australia was so bare and so temporary looking. The houses were all really low and, and it was dry and, and windy and, oh. <laughs> I mean, I love it now, but um, it was a bit of a shock. But... Um, I was an Australian child, of course. I was brought up there, and the first time I heard a magpie, it just I burst into tears because I hadn't heard one for twelve years. But um, so I came back to Australia. The marriage ended, and I seriously started finding myself as a female in a male world, who I was in a male world. But it was also allied with a search for the spiritual and the spiritual feminine and the worldly feminine came together. Mary Magdalene didn't really appear at all. It was more the goddesses. You know, I mean I was I was looking at the goddesses from from a I guess a Jungian point of view that they were archetypes within me. The Greek the Greek goddesses. Yeah. The Greek goddesses particularly. And I've still got these these books about the Greek goddesses looking at them as archetypes within ourselves. So that was that part of it. But I joined a spiritual group, which was a most unusual spiritual group because it was actually within a church, but it was a very unusual church. And I met I my second. You, you know, like kids are supposed to leave home at, what, 19, and you left home instead. <laughs> and then Helen suddenly says, I'm leaving home to um, to join a spiritual community. And we all just went, <laughs> what? <laughs> I didn't even know you were spiritual. Yeah, it was a pretty bizarre thing to do, and I, I still carry a bit of a bit of guilt about doing that, especially leaving my son, who was only eighteen. I left him in the house with these two young feminist women who who were born there. <laughs> he had to learn to work. <laughs> but um, but um, in that community, I really discovered the Christ as an inner spirit. That was, and that was so strange and significant because I went to church as a kid and got totally bored with it, even though I loved the stories. It, you know, I couldn't understand how Jesus saved me when he was dead, <laughs> basically. <laughs> you know, I, I thought that was really stupid. So, um, but in this organisation, there, there was a college as well as a church and the college was really important and I studied in the college and I also ended up teaching in the college. So that was a whole new part of my life. And then when the teacher, Mario Schoenmaker, died, Stephen, my second husband, and I left and we began to form a, a teaching arm of our own community. But um, I also had become really interested in restoring my writing skills. So the first book I wrote was the biography of my former mother-in-law, who was really worth writing about. But I realised that I had an ability to get to the heart of the person. You know, she, she was a TV star working in a, a soapy for, for many, many years. And um, But um, I wanted to find the essence of Sheila. And the mouth thought, and <laughs> yeah, she was the mouth and Dominique's. <laughs> and, um, and then, and then the next one, I started writing a book about a journey which is still there. It was called Eve Grace Child, which I turned to Eden Grace Child because I thought it was too obviously symbolic. 
and it was about a, a new world being created. And I may do something with that eventually, but at the moment, every two years or three years, I go and do some editing on it, and it's changed considerably. But meanwhile, I published a book on the arts, the spiritual significance of the arts, which um, has taken up a large part of my life. You know, um, I have to say that is just to those people who are listening, that is an exceptional book. It, it is. is. I think it's the best. It is a staggeringly good book. If you ever want to understand any relationship between spirituality and the amazing book, it's called the Prodigal Daughters. So, yeah. yeah. And then I decided to write the story of the um, author of the Gospel of St John, who was a mystic and um, understood the Christ from a totally inner point of view and a cosmic point of view too. But um, as I was researching him, this little voice kept whispering in my ear, what about me? And I realised eventually it was Mary Magdalene. And she's hidden in the Gospel of St John as the feminine Christ at initiate. And I thought, my God, this woman is so powerful and so wonderful and so inspirational today. And um, so I wrote a novel about her. And, and then I started a website when the novel was finished because I knew she hadn't finished with me. And that's my journey still. And um, it really talks about how the feminine path to truth and, and wholeness is different from the male path. It's, yeah. it's unique and it, and it has to include the divine feminine. And I, I did a lot of research on um, the Bible to get to this point, and I realised that the feminine divine is hidden. Oh, it's right through it. Right through the Bible. Yeah. Sometimes it's a little bit avert, like mm -hmm. um, wisdom. The Proverbs talk about wisdom as she she waits for us on the on the corners and calls to us and teaches the right ways. You know, she's a goddess. And she's got a very loud voice. Wisdom. She's got a very loud voice, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, of course, the, the the Jews, the Hebrews, were pretty anti the um, feminist religions of the time way back, and so they they tried to get all the Asherahs and the idols out of the temple and just put their have no images at all. They, they were a bit like the Muslims, actually. They um, didn't want images at all and they didn't approve the images of either the gods or the goddesses. But um, she's there. She's there. So that's that's my story of how I came to Mary Magdalene and um, I'm still working with her. I've, I've just um, realised that. I need to take this further into the the understanding of the nature of wisdom now, mm. the nature of the feminine divine called now. Yeah, so that's um, basically what, what I'm still working with. And I oh, just <clears throat> something you mentioned about oh. wisdom being the embodiment. <clears throat> of, I guess, a, div a certain kind of divine intelligence. Steiner talks about that everything in nature is wisdom incarnate, wisdom in form, and that that we are wisdom in form and, and there's an embodiment quality. And I was just wondering what you can let us know, like what is one of the most, what are some of the most important messages from Mary Magdalene about how we can really live, breathe, work, embody her teachings? Yes. Um, well, first of all, I think we have to understand that wisdom is not the same as the earth. You know, there has been a lot of um, Gaia theory around and it's very beautiful and very rich. But the spirit of the earth is different from wisdom. And um, I, I went back to the Egyptian mysteries to understand this and um, came across the goddess um, Nut, N-U-T, I don't know how you pronounce it, and Geb. 
And nut is, nut is the sky and geb is the earth, which is the opposite to, the say, the, the Greek way where Gaia is the earth and, and Zeus yeah. is the sky or Uranus is the I sky. Was so much fascinating how, like, they, they flipped it. And there's a few um, old references where it's the other way around, but go on, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So the, so the original thinking, which is Egyptian, is very old, very old, goes way back beyond the pharaohs. Is, is that this this wisdom that comes from above, oh, yes. Sophia? You I'm might. just going ding 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 ding. Okay, and she falls down to earth through not through a, a fall like you know the fall that's in the Bible or the fallen Sophia that comes through the Gnostics, but that she descended her magic into the earth, even though she's the sky, and united. With the with the mother goddess on the of the earth, so that they they're like sisters. So to discover wisdom, we have to first know the wisdom of the earth, and the wisdom of nature, and the wisdom of how our earth works. And we certainly desperately need that. Yeah. But then we need to know the wisdom that comes from beyond, from from the the heavens, from the divine realms, and that's. That's where the arts come in, actually, because the arts, each art taps into a different level of the spiritual realms. And the spiritual realms are multi-layered, multi-dimensional. I mean, th there's, there's ways of explaining that. I, I like the um, one way of explaining it was a bit like babushka dolls. You know how the, those babush Russian babushka dolls, you take off one layer and there's another layer and there's another layer and there's another layer till you get to the kernel. And, and the spiritual worlds are like that. They layer upon each other and they interweave with each other. And over the ages they've been called divine beings, but there is a oneness about them that comes from the eternal essence of things. And wisdom is part of that. You know, if you if you talk about God, you know the Jewish God, the Christian God, they think of a man with a beard, but God is not male or female. God is is a unity that involves the divine feminine, the divine wisdom. So I I see that in everything we do, wisdom is involved, and all we have to do is tune into wisdom. You know, whenever we have a thought. Wisdom is there, and we kill wisdom with some of the thoughts we have. You know, Indeed. we shut it down. So and why I, Mary? Why Mary? Like, what does Mary Magdalene do for this yeah, journey yeah. with wisdom? Mary, Mary, as far as I know, is the only human being yeah. who knew the Christ as Jesus the man, and knew the Christ is this, as, as the spirit of the cosmos who filtered down, filtered down through the aeons and the levels of spirit into the being of that man temporarily. It could, he could only hold it for a couple of years before he had to die. He had to die anyway because pretty much was, exploded really after three years of holding the Christ yeah. <laughs> Couldn't hold it anymore, and and the only reason the man was chosen because he was a an initiate from the aeons. But and Mary was also such an initiate. So I have a theory, and it's only a theory because I don't know. I'm, I'm not a seer in that deep sense. That they have been together before, and when she met this man, she knew that they had been together before, and she knew there was something about him that was more than just a wisdom teacher, just a spiritual healer. He, he carried something of the cosmos in him. And um, so, so he was the first person, the first human being to see the risen Christ, which is not Jesus risen from the tomb. It's, it's the Christ being becoming part of the earth, uniting with the earth. And it's, it's a quite a deep, complex story that... Um, I'm still coming to terms with and still unravelling and um, it's something that the majority of Christians would have no idea about or they wouldn't um, 
do the things they did in the name of Christ. But and, um, and that for for someone to wit like you're talking about her as the first one to witness that that spiritual transference of Christ energy with Gaia with you know Earth Mother or or the that that union like she witnessed that union and I wonder what happened to her when she witnessed that you know what was I, her I, transformation? I think she was completely transformed yeah. not into a spiritual being but to in a completely spiritualized human being mm -hmm. and it may have happened to one or two of the other disciples as well but it certainly happened to her and that's why she was um, pictured in the Gospel of St John as meeting the Christ. It's a, it's like um, the I am suddenly became her. She was an I am being, a, a future human, really. She's a future human. That's, and that's why I see her influence so profound even now. You know, she she she's still with us, whether she's in incarnation or not. She's still with us and we can tap her energy. And it's it's different from the goddesses because it's a human energy. It's closer to us. It's closer to us. We, no, we can... Life we is can, different. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. I, I know what you mean. It, you feel it differently. You feel it in the heart in a different way. It's like, yeah. oh. Yeah, and it's, 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 it's like she... she becomes you for a moment when you tune her into her mm. you know you enter her body and she enters your body and it's quite strange my, my experiences of Mary Magdalene have been quite strange it's it's they've never been otherworldly but they've been totally otherworldly if you can get the difference because they're not a for half an hour I could keep talking like we could keep talking for ages yeah but um, our time is nearly up. Is there something that you would like particularly to share? And how can people, you know, like connect with you? Right. Well, I do plan to do YouTubes and a bit more sort of out there teaching online, but I am a writer and yeah. an author. And so my website, magdalenchristianity.com, is basically an author's website. It's the stories there. Stories mm -hmm. going back to the beginning of time, stories going back to who Mary Magdalene might be now, maybe not now, but may have been through the ages, what she experienced. So there, it, it's a story form, and I, I've done it with portals, seven portals, and I, I was very daring, and in the, in the last portal I decided to write her gospel as if she was writing it. And it was <laughs> I put that off, I put that off and put that off and one day I just said, do it, or she said, do it, and, and it came like that. It came, it came in a rush. You know, we, we have these missions, don't we? We have these these things that we are here to do. We have the, the resources and the skill sets and it's like, well, if, if we don't, who is going to, you know? That's, that's what I thought, you know, I thought here I am in my 70s, I could be, you know, retired and travelling, or not at the moment because we're just getting coming out of lockdown. But um, you know, I could have, I could be having fun like a lot of other retirees playing golf or something boring like that. But um, I have a purpose, and um, it's to share these things through story, and um, I have more to share too, and um, I will. <laughs> so, magdalenechristianity dot com is is that sharing. MagdalenChristianity.com. Yep. Yes. All, all, right. all lowercase. All right. Thank you so much, Helen. Thank this you. Is my you, you, <laughs> <laughs> you can see we have a great, a great sort of rapport with each other. It's delightful. Mm. Yeah. yeah. All She's right. My friend. She's my teacher as much as I'm her teacher. Mm. So thank you, Dominic. All right, beautiful mama, I love you lots and thank you everybody for watching and thank you, Adriana, for this wonderful opportunity to uh, share in this way on the summit because this is quite a special opportunity.
for us to really dive deep into these stories of awakening and how we are awakening. And the more of us that do awaken, the more opportunity we have to really ch make changes in the world. So thank you. And I'll see you all again. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Helen.